Major breaking news, the United States Court of Appeals for the Third Circuit covering Delaware, New Jersey, and Pennsylvania has just received a major set of papers on behalf of the Firearms Policy Coalition and the Second Amendment Foundation, among others, seeking to knock out Delaware's so-called assault weapon ban and ban on magazines that hold more than 17 rounds. Stay tuned. We're going to break down this legal brief when we get back. Hey, folks, I'm Mark Smith, host of The Four Box, a down and proud American gun owner, constitutional attorney, member of the United States Supreme Court Bar, and author of the brand new best-selling book, Disarmed, What the Ukraine War Teaches Americans About the Right to Bear Arms. And don't forget to follow me on Twitter, if you're on Twitter, at Four Boxes Diner. A lot more Second Amendment content there in addition to this channel. All right, folks, major breaking news. We have a major submission today by the Firearms Policy Coalition and the Second Amendment Foundation in the United States Court of Appeals for the Third Circuit. Now, keep in mind that the Third Circuit Court of Appeals is generally speaking, although not perfect, is generally speaking a reasonably good Second Amendment court to be in. This is the same court that en banc gave us the Second Amendment victory in the Range versus United States case that said that Brian Range, who was convicted 20 years ago of a state misdemeanor and thus turned into a quote-unquote felon under federal law, that that federal statute as applied to Mr. Range was unconstitutional under the Second Amendment. That was the Third Circuit Court of Appeals. So here, in the case of uh, Gray versus the state of Delaware, and among others, the Firearms Policy Coalition, the Second Amendment Foundation, among others, have filed a brief arguing that Delaware's so-called assault weapon ban, which is really just a ban on semi-automatic rifles, and magazines that hold more than 17 rounds, are unconstitutional under the Supreme Court's relevant precedent, precedent of Heller and, to some degree, Bruin. Now, this should be a slam dunk. However, when this was litigated in front of Judge Andrews, I believe it was, in the United States District Court for the District of Delaware, Judge Andrews rejected this argument on behalf of the plaintiff, saying that, no, no, even though these firearms that are being banned and these magazines that are being banned are in common use by Americans for lawful purposes, which they undeniably are, he went on to then say that there's a whole bunch of historical analog laws that allow us to regulate arms. Keyword, regulate arms. Apparently, the judge has failed to understand the difference between regulating something and outright banning it. Because if you ban something, there's nothing to regulate. Now, is there? But apparently, looking at the lower court record here in this case, the federal district court judge used a bunch of historical precedents for regulating firearms and said that justified banning these semi-automatic rifles. Obviously an absurd ruling. Another judge out there that obviously failed to understand the clear language of Heller and its binding precedent on Heller, despite the fact that the district court judge is obviously an inferior court as defined by Article 3 of the U.S. Constitution. Nevertheless, the good news is we hope that the troops are here to rescue those gun owners in Delaware and their semi-automatic rifles, and their magazines that hold more than 17 rounds. Because the argument, and I'll put a link to this brief down below, the initial brief has been filed, and guess what? It's making, by and large, all the right arguments. There's only a couple minor modifications I might have made to this brief, but overall, it's an excellent brief, essentially starting off with the obvious, that the Second Amendment plaintiffs must prevail in their challenge to Delaware's bans, to on, on commonly owned semi-automatic firearms and magazines because those arms, arms are in common use by law, for lawful purposes and thus are protected by the Second Amendment and cannot be banned. That is this Heller decision, which we've talked about repeatedly on this channel. Just as a reminder of what's being banned by Delaware, Delaware banned commonly possessed firearms, including quote-unquote assault weapons, which is just a, you know, a political propaganda term for semi-automatic rifles, and they also ban, quote-unquote, large-capacity magazines, which are also commonly owned by Americans, uh, because they hold more than 17 rounds. Now, most AR-15s that I'm aware of and AK-47s here in the United States, they generally take a magazine of 30 rounds. That's what is standard capacity. Anything below that, assuming you're firing 5.56 five, or 223 rounds, of course, guess what? That is really compelled by state laws that may require a, a magazine of less than 30 rounds. But it's usually not the choice of consumers who are given the choice as to what they want to buy. Now, I should note 
that Delaware, I'm not going to get into the details of this because it's so absurd, but I want to say that some of the dangerous characteristics of these quote-unquote assault weapons that the state of Delaware has labeled as a problem include things like a forward pistol grip. Woo! Boy, is that scary. A flash suppressor, which of course one needs at night if you're going to fire it in the evening in pitch black and you don't want to go blind for several seconds, which could cost you your life while the bad guy comes at you after you've been blinded by the shot. A grenade launcher or flare launcher, because obviously grenade launching and flare launching uh, is the source of many deaths in the United States. Not every year. It also includes things like a pistol grip or a folding or telescoping stock. Failing to recognize that the reason why you want a folding or telescoping stock could very well simply be because you want different people in the home to be able to use it. And different people are different sizes with different arms lengths. And you want to be able to make an adjustment depending on who is using the quote unquote family defense gun. Uh, no different than the old-fashioned shotgun above the uh, up fireplace uh, in old-time America where everyone would use that as uh, to defend the home, depending on who was home at the time. And, of course, the scary pistol grip. This is all absurd, and this is what Delaware labeled as a quote-unquote assault weapon. Now, we've talked about this before. The Supreme Court in Heller is the case that applies when a court confronts an arms ban case, whether it be a magazine ban or whether it be a rifle ban. And the Supreme Court says that the only historical precedent that might exist out there in any conceivable way for banning any kind of firearm is a law that existed, laws that existed, that prevented the carrying of dangerous and unusual weapons. But the Supreme Court said that is a historical analog that shows that to the extent a weapon is not Unusual, for example, meaning income used by Americans for lawful purposes, it by definition cannot be banned as protected by the Second Amendment, period, full stop. Hello? That's what Heller said. But of course, this judge, Judge Andrews, conveniently concluded, in fact, that these firearms were generally in common use, and then went on to do this Bruin analogy, and then talked about various things such as, guess what? We've talked about it on this channel before so-called unprecedented social change or unprecedented technological change, all of which is stupid. Why? You see, the in common use test set forth by the Supreme Court in Heller says that arms that are in common use today in contemporary America are by definition protected. In common use today. Now, there may be other ways to protect arms, by the way. But we're not getting into those others. We don't need to worry about other things today because we were talking about semi-automatic rifles and magazines that hold more than 10 rounds or more than 17 rounds. We don't need it to be exotic. We don't need to be crazy. We don't need to talk about like the history of the... We don't need to do any of that. It's not hard. We simply just have to get courts to do their job and apply the binding Supreme Court precedent of Heller that says that if a firearm or any kind of an arm is in common use for lawful purposes by Americans, it's protected, period, full stop. That's it. Nothing more. But of course, these lower courts, including Judge Richard Andrews in Delaware, try to use as an out the argument that unprecedented social change or unprecedented technological change somehow is a get out of free, get out of jail free card when it comes to the in common use test and tries to talk about things like, you know, mass shootings and stuff like this as if this is new. But we know this is hogwash. Why? Well, let's just go through these quickly. First, before the Supreme Court decided the Heller case that created the in-common use test, it didn't create it, it affirmed an existing in-common use test from the Miller case in the 1930s from the Supreme Court. Guess what happened in 2007, right before the 2008 Heller decision? In 2007 in Virginia Tech, a single lone gunman using semi-automatic pistols and magazines holding more than 10 rounds killed dozens of people with Virginia Tech. The Supreme Court was well aware of this because it was brought to their attention repeatedly by the gun control supporters on behalf of D.C. in Heller. And the Supreme Court was aware of this and still said, yeah, no, not relevant to whether or not the Second Amendment protects the rights of law-abiding Americans. The fact that someone can misuse a gun or misuse a car or misuse a knife or misuse a cup or a glass doesn't matter. We don't measure constitutional rights that way. We focus on how law-abiding Americans use them. So Heller decided the in common use test, use test, which is still the binding precedent on these lower inferior courts, even though some of them, like Judge Andrews, seems to be ignoring them. You cannot say that modern semi-automatic firearms that hold more than 10 rounds or 17 rounds 
uh, or any of these things are unprecedented social change or unprecedented technological change or anything like this in the context of gun ban cases. Because all of these events that the anti-gunners in 2023 are saying unprecedented, whether in terms of society or technology, all this occurred before 2008. And there's certainly nothing new in this sense today. Again, you had mass shootings before 2008's Heller decision, including Virginia Tech. You had school shootings and school mass murders going all the way back to the founding, the founding period where a uh, school teacher, Enoch Brown in Pennsylvania, or modern day Pennsylvania, and his dozen kids were all massacred by Indians. So they're aware of the dangers of schools being attacked in mass murders. We also know of the Indian raids that were so ubiquitous that during the Heller oral argument, Supreme Court Justice Anthony Kennedy literally asked the lawyer for, the, for Washington, D.C., who was supporting the gun control. Justice Kennedy says, well, didn't the founding fathers need firearms for all sorts of purposes, including to defend themselves against criminals, Indians, wolves, bears, and things like this? So Justice Kennedy got it right, right there at the oral argument in Heller. Obviously all true. And let us not forget what I've talked about in this channel. This is one of the things I might have done to improve this particular brief, which I think was a very good brief, but I might have added to it, is the Boston Massacre, obviously at the start of the American Revolution, where you had you know eight Americans shot and killed in a mass shooting in Boston, where the Brits were represented by John Adams, our founding father. I might have specifically mentioned the Boston Massacre in this brief. I might also have specifically mentioned the school massacre at the time of the founding of Enoch Brown. Two specific points that, from my skim of this brief, by the Firearms Policy Coalition and Second Amendment Foundation, I did not see, but I might have thrown that in there uh, if, if I were involved. But again, uh, not my case, uh, not my thing. So uh, I'm not second-guessing anybody. I'm just throwing that out there as a suggestion. Just a few additional points before I wrap up this session. Number one is, uh, I think it was an excellent job by the, brief, in the, by the brief writers here to quote Clarence Thomas in an interesting thing that I'm, I probably should send out on Twitter and put out here. It's something for you to know. Justice Thomas wrote uh, in a dissenting opinion in a case called Stenberg versus Carhart, which I actually think was an abortion-related case. Here's what he wrote. Very interesting. This is Clarence Thomas. Quote, prior to 1989, the term assault weapon did not exist in the lexicon of firearms. It is a political term developed by anti-gun publicists. Period, close quote. Did you know that Clarence Thomas said that in a Supreme Court opinion in 2000? Well, he did. And I'm glad that the lawyers brought that up here. The next thing that I thought was very powerful is uh, Justice Scalia and Clarence Thomas in a dissent in the case of Friedman. For those of you who are aware of uh, Frank Easterbrook's terrible Second Amendment rulings out of the Seventh Circuit. You're going to like this. This is what Clarence Thomas said, and this was joined by Sc Justice Scalia in 2015 in um, dissenting from the denial of cert in the Friedman case out of the Seventh Circuit. This is what Thomas wrote, quote, remember the Friedman case involved a ban on semi-automatic firearms uh, rifles. Uh, quote, citizens have a right under the Second Amendment to keep AR-style AR style semi-automatic rifles because roughly 5 million Americans own them and the overwhelming majority do so for lawful purposes. Did you hear what I said? In 2015, Clarence Thomas and Justice Scalia are writing in, in a Supreme Court decision that the roughly 5 million Americans that own these AR-15s make it in common use and protect them under the Second Amendment. Don't forget that very powerful thing. The other thing that's very interesting is, as you know, Brett Kavanaugh, if you ever saw me on Fox News during the Brett Kavanaugh confirmation hearings, you would have heard me made this point repeatedly about his powerful dissent in the Heller 2 case when he was on the D.C. Court of Appeals. Uh, this is what Brett Kavanaugh, when he was Judge Brett Kavanaugh, before he was Justice Brett Kavanaugh, wrote about the AR-15 in Heller 2's dissent. He wrote that America's, quote, most popular semi-automatic rifle is the AR-15. And by the way, uh, uh, Brett Kavanaugh in that concluded that AR-15s are protected arms under the Second Amendment in that Heller II dissent. The only other thing I might have done, uh, I don't see it in this brief here, but I might have added to this brief, uh, food for thought, is don't forget that the ATF itself in their regulations on things like frame and receivers, if you actually look at it, it specifically has a sentence in there, which I reported on this before, where they literally say the AR-15s are the most popular rifle in America. And I think quoting the ATF 
in a brief like this is a good idea because the ATF is the quote unquote experts, ha ha ha, uh, but you know, people can perceive of them as the experts. And certainly if the ATF says AR-15s are the most popular rifle in America, well, I think you can take that to the bank. Even the anti-gunners have no choice but to accept that because obviously that's the case. That's why they keep complaining about the AR-15 and too many AR-15s in America and too many magazines that hold more than 10 rounds in America, uh, but that makes them protected among other things. The only other point I wanna make here is I did notice this is brief sites to a hand some YouTuber, Mark Smith, a couple different times, a couple different articles. Um, I'm going to do a standalone video, I think, in the next few days about how to use some of my materials and how to properly cite them to get the biggest bang for the buck out of them. I think they did a perfectly fine job here, uh, but I got some ideas about how to use some of my scholarship in litigations. Uh, again, it'll just be food for thought, and that'll be something I talk about in a uh, couple in another future video at some point uh, in the near future. But I did notice. Uh, that Mark Smith did appear in this brief a couple times, a couple different articles, uh, one on, of course, the argument about the importance of 1791 as the priority over 1868 because, well, the Second Amendment arose in 1791, and that is the key time period for determining the scope of it. And the, all the 1868 period did was the ratification of the 14th Amendment. But all the 14th Amendment did is it took the Second Amendment and the rest of the Bill of Rights and applied it to the states and the counties, and it expanded the number of uh, the scope of who it covered and protected to encompass the uh, recently, then recently freed African American slaves. So that's all the 14th Amendment did. Uh, it did not expand or shrink the scope in any respect of the Second Amendment. It certainly did not shrink it. Maybe you could argue it expanded, but it certainly did not shrink it. Uh, it cannot possibly shrink the scope of the Second Amendment below or under what it was understood to mean in 1791. And the only other point I want to make is the other article talks about is my powerful points on why uh, in common use encompasses modern day social change and modern day technological changes because obviously if you're measuring and contemplating what modern day firearms do today, modern day technology does today, well obviously the in common use test already assumes implicitly the notion of any modern day or social changes or technological changes because by definition in those weapons in common use today uh, already account for all modern day social changes and all uh, technological changes that have occurred up until the moment in history today. So the in common use test already encompasses any of these quote unquote unprecedented or other social or technical changes or technological changes and it is not a get out of free jail card for the anti-gunners to use to rewrite among other things the Supreme Court precedent in Heller to keep that in mind and uh, we've talked about them before here okay folks hope you learned a little bit something here today we got a lot more videos coming out here in the four boxes diner make sure you subscribe if you haven't done so already follow me on twitter at four boxes diner and again we'll see you again soon here at the four boxes diner orders up table 2a